Adolf Hitler, the 20th century's most evil genius, the warlord and war criminal who was to die by his own hand on the 30th of April, 1945. Is this his body? Ever since Hitler's death, mystery has shrouded the last moments of his life and the final resting place of his corpse. Are these fragments of bone in a Moscow archive the last mortal remains of Adolf Hitler after his death in the Berlin bunker? Today, the Brandenburg Gate stands at the center of a reunited Berlin. But has the city yielded up its last secrets? The view from the Brandenburg Gate was very different before the Second World War. Hitler had planned that these classical columns would be the centerpiece of a triumphal avenue at the heart of a Reich, which he predicted would last a thousand years. From this point, an empire would reach eastwards to the Urals and westwards to the Atlantic Ocean. But conquerors came from the east and west. By the end of April 1945, the flames of defeat licked around the blackened pillars of the Brandenburg Gate. The Reich that was to have lasted a thousand years was over within 30. The Führer's final headquarters had been the Reich Chancellery in the heart of Berlin. Now its vast halls were silent and empty, its windows blown out, dreams of world conquest shattered. These models, created by Albert Speer, Hitler's architect and wartime armaments minister, were all that remained of the Führer's vision of the capital to be built after victory had been secured. Colossal projections of the doodles Hitler had drawn in his days as a failed art student they are the bleak expressions of his politics of domination, lacking any hint of human scale. But Hitler's last architectural monument lay underground, in the bunker in the Chancellery Garden to which he retreated in the dying days of the Third Reich. It is an irony that sophisticated, cynical Berlin had never been a stronghold of Nazism. But it was here that the career of Adolf Hitler came to an end. After the guns had fallen silent, the search for the body of Adolf Hitler had obsessed the Soviet leader, Josef Stalin. It spawned a flood of newspaper stories that the dictator was alive. The demon king continued to cast a spell. People had lived for so long under the threat of Adolf Hitler that his menacing presence had become part of the fabric of their lives. In a strange way, they were reluctant to let him go. But where had Adolf Hitler gone? His career had begun where it was to end, in a Berlin court in the chaos of defeat in 1980, at the end of the First World War. The troops had marched home, unbeaten in the field, but the war was over. Adolf Hitler had always stood apart from his fellow men. As the young down and out in Vienna in August 1914, his eyes ablaze with the prospect of war. As a corporal in the trenches of the Western Front, gassed twice and winner of the Iron Cross first class. As the beer hall rabble rouser of the early 1920s, the leader of the nascent Nazi party. And as the leader of Germany, the man of destiny, convinced that his task was to reverse the defeat of 1918 and restore Germany as a world power. 
The Nazi party was the child of bitterness, disorder, and inflation. After the failure of a military coup in Munich in 1923, Hitler had pursued a constitutional path to power, but his rhetoric was laced with violence and hatred. Hitler's contempt for democracy was palpable. Force was to drive the machinery of the state he was to inherit. In 1933, the chancellorship of a Germany wrecked by economic depression and maneuvering politicians fell into his lap. Hitler was the master now. He bound the armed forces to him by a personal oath of allegiance. Hitler was now the dictator of Germany. For the majority of Germans, Nazi rule meant the restoration of national pride after the humiliations heaped on them in 1918. It was Hitler's political genius to tap into this combination of resentment and yearning for rebirth. Under the leadership of Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's personal bodyguard, the SS, swelled into a state within a state. These were the standard bearers of Nazism. Soon they would become the scourge of Germany. Later, they would become the scourge of occupied Europe. Racism underpinned Nazi philosophy. The persecution of the Jews was the first step along the bitter road which led to the death camps at Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Majdanek. Rallies, fearful in their symmetry, demonstrated national unity, strength of purpose, and growing military might. They provided Hitler with the platform from which he could stir the passions he had aroused in Germans. Rearmament proceeded swiftly, at first secretly, and then announced to the world in 1935. Skillful propaganda concealed the underlying weakness of Germany's expanding armed forces. But to the leaders of the watching democracies, still scarred by memories of the trenches, they seemed to present a formidable threat, and Hitler exploited this to win his first bloodless victories. In March 1936, against the advice of his generals, he marched into the demilitarized Rhineland. Two years later, Hitler absorbed Austria, which opened the way to Czechoslovakia's German-speaking Sudetenland, and then the whole of Czechoslovakia in March 1939. Where would he move next? Hitler's attention was now focused on one of Germany's traditional enemies, Poland. His target was the corridor of Polish territory which divided East Prussia from the rest of the Reich and ran to the port of Danzig. This city contained a substantial German population dominated by the local Nazi party and was the source of growing tension between Poland and Germany. On the 23rd of August, 1939, Hitler secured his eastern flank through a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, signed by the Russian Foreign Minister Molotov and his German counterpart, von Ribbentrop. The die was now cast. On the 3rd of September, German forces invaded Poland. Poland fell after a campaign which lasted barely six weeks. By the midsummer of 1940, Hitler dominated much of Western Europe, either through his conquests or his alliance with Benito Mussolini's Italy. In April 1941, Hitler secured his southern flank in the Balkans in another lightning campaign. Yugoslavia and Greece were overwhelmed in the space of two weeks. These fresh conquests completed Hitler's domination of continental Europe. Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria 
were reduced to vassal states. On the other side of the English Channel, the British and their Prime Minister Winston Churchill remained defiant. But Britain's Atlantic shipping lifeline was coming under increasing threat from packs of German U-boats. If the U-boats could cut the British off from the vital food, raw materials and munitions supplied by America, they might well be forced to drop out of the war. The British were hanging on by their fingernails. The Bletchley Codebreakers provided early and detailed warning of Hitler's invasion of Russia, codenamed Barbarossa, which burst over the Red Army on the 22nd of June, 1941. The Germans swept forward in the scorching summer heat. Millions of Russian troops were encircled and taken prisoner. But in October, Barbarossa began to slow as the snows arrived. Nevertheless, by early December, German forces were at the gates of the Soviet Union's greatest cities. It seemed that one last effort must clinch final victory. But by then, the war had widened. On the 7th of December, 1941, Japan had attacked the great American naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The destruction or disabling of eight US battleships began a Japanese rampage through the Pacific and the Far East. Four days later, Hitler made his crucial strategic mistake by declaring war on the United States. He had sowed the wind, Germany would reap the whirlwind. On the 19th of December, Hitler dismissed Field Marshal von Brauchitsch, commander-in-chief of the German army, and assumed personal command of the campaign in Russia. So far, Hitler had been the master of events. Soon, they would master him. In 1942, Hitler resumed the offensive. The panzers drove forward again on the seemingly endless step of southern Russia. But as winter arrived, an entire German army was encircled at Stalingrad. It was the first major setback for Hitler on the Eastern Front. He was now fighting the war from the map. Cut off from military reality at his headquarters at Rastenburg in the dank and gloomy pine forests of East Prussia. It was here, where only crumbling concrete remains, that the war was lost. By the late summer of 1943, British and American bombers were setting Germany's cities ablaze. In the east, Hitler's armored elite was being relentlessly ground up by new Russian tank armies. The tide had turned in the Battle of the Atlantic. The view from the Brandenburg Gate was changing, although a forced optimism prevailed in the capital of the Third Reich. Defeat seemed a long way off. On the 25th of April, 1944, Berliners celebrated the Führer's 55th birthday. The heaps of rubble in the city center sported small swastika flags, and placards proclaimed, our walls broken, our hearts not. But three months later, Allied armies were pouring ashore in Normandy. The defenses of Hitler's fortress Europe had been breached. there were flowers, but much hard fighting lay ahead as the Allies approached the borders of the Reich. American military might could not be held at bay by German high-technology weapons. 
Rockets and jets were remarkable scientific achievements, but they failed to restore the military balance in Germany's favor. In December 1944, Hitler launched his last doomed offensive in the West, striking at the Anglo-American armies through the forests of the Ardennes, the scene of his great triumph in May 1940. The Ardennes offensive consumed the last of Hitler's armored reserves. The Allies had been shaken by the speed and force of the attack, but it had gained the Third Reich a mere month of borrowed time. On the Eastern Front, the New Year brought a massive Red Army offensive, which carried it from the River Vistula to the Oder, 50 miles from Berlin. The advance began to uncover the full horror of the death camps. Red Army troops had liberated Auschwitz on the 27th of January. They found only 7,600 emaciated survivors of the two million men, women and children who had died there. Death hung in the air during these last months of the war. The Russians were now preparing for the assault on Berlin. 23 armies were moving into position on the Oder. The commander of the Western Allies, General Eisenhower, had decided not to race the Russians to the German capital. The Allies had already agreed to dismember Germany after the war, and Berlin lay deep inside the zone allotted to the Russians. In November 1944, Hitler had left Rastenburg's blockhouses and belts of barbed wire for the last time. He returned to Berlin on the 16th of January. Initially, Hitler took up residence in the Reich Chancellery, whose marbled halls had witnessed the glory days of the Third Reich. There was little glory now. The Chancellery's boarded up windows stared sightlessly out onto a desolate, rubble-choked landscape. Soon the intensity of the Allied bombing forced Hitler and his SS guards underground, into the deep shelter in the Chancellery garden designed by his architect, Albert Speer. The bunker had two levels. On the upper were the kitchens and staff living quarters. Down a small spiral staircase lay the Führer bunker proper. On the right were the switchboard room, generators and the quarters assigned to Hitler's physicians. On the left were Hitler's private rooms, which included a conference room, office, sitting room, and bedroom. Physically, the Führer was a dreadful sight, like a man risen from the grave. He was awash with the drugs provided by his doctors, and his left arm shook uncontrollably with the onset of Parkinson's disease. He had ordered Berlin to be turned into a fortress, the last of his great illusions. At the center of the city's last ditch defense ring, codenamed Citadel, were six huge flak towers, concrete ziggurats impervious to bombs and artillery. The largest at the Berlin Zoo housed a hundred strong garrison, a hospital, and on its lower floors provided air raid shelter for 15,000 civilians. The flak towers gave only the illusion of security. At least 200,000 fully equipped and well-trained troops were needed to defend Berlin. But all that remained was a mixture of shredded regular formations, police, Hitler Youth, and members of the Volkssturm, the German equivalent of the British Home Guard. Old men and boys marched off to the front, while civilians erected makeshift barricades. On Sunday the 15th of April, Hitler was joined in the bunker by Eva Braun, the woman who had been his mistress since 1932. Eva Braun was a figure as unknown to most Germans as she was to the outside world. A blonde, empty-headed beauty obsessed with romantic movies and cheap novels, Eva had spent most of the war in the Führer's mountaintop retreat at Berchtesgaden in the Bavarian Alps. But showing a loyalty greater than many of Hitler's erstwhile henchmen, she had come to join him in Berlin. For a month, Eva had lived in the Chancellery. Now she moved into the bunker. Hitler's SS guards realized that her arrival meant that the game was up. They christened Eva Braun the Angel of Death. 
Also claiming a place at Hitler's side was Josef Goebbels, his propaganda chief, and for many years, the Gauleiter of Berlin. Goebbels had lost none of his flair. He threw himself into orchestrating the downfall of the Third Reich as if it was grand opera with an unlimited budget. Never far from Hitler's side in the bunker was the pudgily sinister figure of Martin Bormann, Hitler's secretary, who controlled all access to the Fuhrer and had been a witness at the marriage of Eva Braun's sister to a young SS officer, Hermann Fegelein. Bormann was universally loathed, and he knew that if he left the bunker, his power would be extinguished. Flying into Berlin and the bunker on the 22nd of April were a strange couple. A feastless stork spotter plane landed to disgorge the test pilot and fanatical Nazi Hannah Reich and a badly wounded general, Robert Ritter von Grein. The only reason Hitler had summoned von Grein was to inform him that he'd been made field marshal and commander of the non-existent Luftwaffe. Hitler's air chief and his co-pilot were now stranded beneath the ruins of Berlin. The airless claustrophobia of the bunker was the final baleful expression of the artificiality and isolation of Hitler's own existence. In the glare of the electric lights, night merged into day. The last military conference usually ended at about six in the morning, after which Hitler would slump exhausted on his sofa to guzzle cream cakes. But in spite of his physical disintegration, Hitler still possessed the reserves of will to galvanize those who came to see him. Only Albert Speer had the detachment to consider putting an end to the grisly charade by flooding the bunker's ventilation system with poison gas. Conspicuously absent from the bunker were the deputy Führer, Hermann Göring, and SS chief, Heinrich Himmler. Their last meeting with the Führer had been at a melancholy 56th birthday party held for him on the 20th of April. Afterwards, Göring left hurriedly for southern Germany, while Himmler headed north to his SS haven in Schleswig-Holstein. It was on this occasion that Hitler made his last public appearance, patting the cheeks of the boy defenders of the Third Reich. By this stage in the war, the code-breaking establishment at Bletchley Park had expanded to house no fewer than 12,000 people. Perhaps their greatest achievement was to break the highest grade German messages, many of which, including Hitler's, were encoded on the Lorenz machine. The Bletchley decrypts gave British intelligence a ringside seat at the fall of the Third Reich. On the 15th of April, the code breakers read the Fuhrer's last order of the day. It vainly trumpeted that, once again, Bolshevism will suffer Asia's old fate. It will founder on the capital of the Reich. Berlin stays German, Vienna will be German again, and Europe will never be Russian. In reality, the work of the Y service was almost done. The next day, the 16th of April, 1945, the Red Army launched its assault on Berlin. After a furious armored battle for the Zalo Heights, defending the eastern approaches to Berlin, Russian shock troops broke into the outskirts of the city. Berliners braced themselves for the end. Within a week, crisis point had been reached in the bunker. Berlin was now cut off on three sides, and Soviet tanks were probing round to the west of the city. At the midday military conference, Hitler blurted out the unthinkable. The war was lost. 
the formations he marshaled on his war maps were phantom armies. The same day saw the exodus from the bunker of the two men who had attended the Führer's conferences throughout the war, Keitel and Jodl, his chiefs of staff, the desk soldiers who had presided over the ruin of the Wehrmacht. On the 23rd of April, Goering secured his own dismissal by sending a telegram to Hitler from Berchtesgaden, suggesting that he assume overall leadership of the Reich. In fact, Goering was planning to fly to meet Eisenhower to discuss peace terms. His biggest concern, however, was which of his many magnificent uniforms he should wear for the surrender. Goering never kept his appointment with Eisenhower. He was captured by the Americans and then placed under arrest. Goering was now a hopeless morphine addict, but there would be time enough for his captors to wean him off the drug and prepare him to face trial for war crimes. While this pantomime was being played out, the people of Berlin were preparing themselves for the street battle about to engulf them. Hitler seldom emerged from the bunker now. This was the last time the Führer was caught by the camera, stooped and shuffling, displaying all the signs of a senile man. Hitler's last hopes lay with General Wenck's 12th Army to the west of Berlin. Keitel arrived at Wenck's headquarters, flourishing his field marshal's baton and urging him to relieve the city. Very sensibly, Wenck decided to stay put. To capture the city, the Russians were to lose 300,000 men killed, wounded, or missing. On the 25th of April, Russian and American forces joined hands at Torgau on the river Elbe, 60 miles south of Berlin. Here was a brief display of comradeship in arms before the onset of the Cold War sundered the alliance between the Soviet Union and the United States. In Berlin, the situation was desperate. Water and public transport systems had collapsed. Food stocks were down to no more than three days. Berliners cowered in their cellars while SS court martial flying squads roamed the streets, shooting or hanging anyone, even the wounded, whom they deemed to be a deserter. Cellars now offered scant safety as the Russians attempted to outflank the street defenses of the citadel by smashing their way through courtyards, buildings and basements, blasting through party walls and leaving a trail of rape and destruction behind them. A stunned populace submitted with bewilderment to that characteristically Russian mixture of savagery and sudden, unexpected generosity. A Red Army man might rape a woman and then reappear bearing presents of food to protect her against other soldiers. Dazed Hitler youth were disarmed, given a cuff round the ear, and packed off home. The end was approaching. On the 28th of April, Hitler was informed that Heinrich Himmler, his most trusted lieutenant from the earliest days of the Nazi party, had been attempting to negotiate a surrender with the Allies. The first victim of Himmler's treachery was Hermann Fegelein, Eva Braun's brother-in-law and Himmler's representative in the bunker. Mm -hmm. 
Fegelein had fled the madhouse and made his way through the ruined streets of Berlin to his mistress' apartment, from which he was hauled back, his pockets stuffed with getaway money and jewels, to be shot. Ava Brown had lost a brother-in-law, but was shortly to gain a husband. In the small hours of the 29th of April, as fighting raged around the Reichstag, Hitler married his mistress. It was to be one of the shortest, but most celebrated of wartime marriages. After the wedding, there was a reception in Hitler's suite. Gamely, Ava tried to keep everyone's spirits up. Barely 200 yards from the bunker, the Red Army was reading the last rites of the Third Reich. Later that day, Hitler was told of the death of his old ally, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, and his mistress, Clara Petacci. They'd been captured by partisans, shot, and their corpses strung up outside a Milan garage. Hitler had, as he put it, no intention of winding up as an exhibit in a Moscow zoo. He now set about preparing his own end, testing the poison he intended to use on himself and Ava Brown on his dog, Blondie. To the end, he resisted all urgings for him to leave Berlin for the safety of a last-ditch Nazi redoubt in the mountains of Bavaria. At about 3.20 in the afternoon of the 30th of April, Hitler and Eva Braun withdrew into the Führer's suite. Eva was wearing the Führer's favorite dress, black with pink roses on either side of a low neckline. The accessories comprised pistols, and cyanide pills. The heavy door closed behind them. Ten minutes passed. None of the waiting group heard a shot through the thick door. Then, as they'd been ordered, they entered Hitler's suite. Ava's body was on the sofa. She had bitten into a cyanide capsule. Hitler had shot himself in the temple while simultaneously taking the poison. His blood had stained the carpet. The two corpses were then wrapped in blankets and carried up to the chancellery garden. Hitler weighed about 170 pounds and it was hard to maneuver him up the narrow staircase. Hitler's chief valet, Heinz Linger, later recalled these events in 1960. I was the last who say goodbye to him and the first to see the body. He and Eva Braun died alone. Did he give you any last orders? Yes, to destroy his personal positions and burn his bodies. And did you carry them out? Yes, I used petrol but there was a so a flush that uh, they were not completely burned. Where do you think Hellinger Hitler's body is now? Buried in the uh, park of the Chantilly. Yeah. The Russians have never found Hitler's body. Linger's account is only partially correct. The two bodies were placed in a trench and doused with petrol, which was set ablaze with pieces of flaming paper. They were only partially burned and then buried in a second, deeper trench. But they did not stay there long. The corpses were to be discovered by the Russians. We are the Military Channel. The fighting continued as Adolf Hitler met his sub-Wagnerian end. It was not until nearly midnight on the 30th that the red banner appeared on the roof of the Reichstag. The event was carefully restaged for the cameras the next day. Delight for the Red Army victors. 
Despair for the survivors of the bunker who had formed a number of escape parties after Hitler's suicide. And dismay for the German people who now heard a radio broadcast announcing the death of Adolf Hitler. There was no fight for the bunker. The first Russians to enter it, early on the morning of the 2nd of May, were female members of the Red Army Medical Corps. Among the spoils of war they gathered were several of Eva Brown's lace braziers. Then combat troops arrived and began rounding up bunker personnel to be sent to Moscow for interrogation. Zhukov now had an urgent task on his hands, the delivery to his master, Josef Stalin, of the body of Adolf Hitler. Stalin had been informed of Hitler's death by suicide on the morning of the 1st of May. The recovery of the body was soon to become a morbid obsession. While Zhukov toured the wrecked chancellery, the search for Hitler's body was taken out of the hands of the Red Army and given over to the NKVD, the Russian secret police. The NKVD was simultaneously sinister and bumbling, and there followed a chapter of accidents in the rubble-strewn chaos of the chancellery. Five search teams were put to work. Their first discovery was the charred but recognizable corpses of Josef and Magda Goebbels, who had committed suicide on the night of the 29th. Inside the upper bunker were found the bodies of their six children, poisoned by their mother. The next day, the Russians chanced on a strange find, a Hitler lookalike bobbing in a water tank. The doppelganger was identified as Hitler, but the NKVD were not convinced. The man had darned socks. Who the double was and how he met his end remain a mystery. On the 3rd of May, two more bodies were uncovered those of a man and a woman. But it was not until two days later, as the search continued, that their significance was grasped. The corpses were exhumed and taken to a hospital now occupied by the Red Army. On the 8th of May, VE Day, an autopsy was carried out and Hitler's corpse identified by close questioning of two Berlin dental technicians, who in 1944 had worked on a bridge for the Führer's molars. The corpses were crated up for another journey. This time the road led to Magdeburg, deep inside the Russian zone of occupation in what would become East Germany. The bodies were buried in the yard of the local headquarters of the NKVD. As far as Zhukov was concerned, the mystery had been solved. By mid-May, several of the British and American top brass had been discreetly informed that Hitler had died in the bunker. But then Zhukov began to change his tune. By mid-July, when the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill arrived in Berlin for the Potsdam Conference, General Eisenhower had also gone on record to cast doubt on the evidence of Hitler's death. Churchill toured the chancellery and also visited the site of the grave, an excursion which left him visibly depressed. It was Stalin attempting to ignore the solid proof of the Fuhrer's death who was causing all the mischief, actively circulating rumors that his old adversary was still alive. It did not lighten the mood of the Potsdam Conference. The British then decided to conduct their own investigation into the last days of Hitler. It was placed in the hands of Hugh Trevor Roper, 
a young Oxford Don who was now an intelligence officer. In November 1945, Trevor Roper outlined at a press conference what became the official version of events. The marriage, the double suicide, and the burning in the chancellery garden. The report became a book, one of thousands subsequently written on Hitler. For the Fuhrer, there was a literary life after death. In the immediate post-war years, stories continued to circulate that Hitler was alive. They conveniently ignored the fact that in any event, the Parkinson's disease would have quickly crippled him and hastened his end. Hitler had escaped Allied retribution, a fate meted out to 21 of his wartime henchmen at Nuremberg in the war crimes trial which began in November 1945. Goering was there, a shadow of his former self, but now free of drugs. Heinrich Himmler was dead. Captured by the British in North Germany on the 21st of May, he had crunched a cyanide pill. Nor was Martin Bormann at Nuremberg. It's almost certain that he too took his own life in the immediate aftermath of the breakout from the bunker. Bormann could have had few illusions about the fate which awaited him if captured. The judgment on the defendants at Nuremberg was delivered on the 30th of September, 1946. Eleven of them were sentenced to death. On the night of the 15th of October, Goering cheated his executioners by swallowing a concealed cyanide capsule. On the next day, the rest went to the gallows. The memory of Adolf Hitler like a ghastly bloodstain across the fabric of Europe, cannot be expunged. But his body, and that of Eva Braun, were to be consigned to the flames a second time. Removed from their anonymous grave in 1970, they were burned. Sergei Kondrashev, a retired KGB general, explains. And then it was decided to destroy them completely and it was done in 1970. So um, there is an act um, duly um, done um, on, the, um, um, on the destruction. I assure you it, they were destroyed, that there is nothing remains. But was the general accurate? The Moscow archives contain the files on Stalin's macabre preoccupation with Hitler's body. These include accounts of a reconstruction of the bunker melodrama staged in 1946, in which the captured survivors relived their roles in the death of Adolf Hitler. And for the curious, there are skull fragments. One of these reveals a bullet hole in the temple. This grisly relic is, perhaps, all that remains of the man whose career of unprecedented evil was brought to an end by a pistol and a poison capsule on the afternoon of the 30th of April, 1945. In the spring of